Hello and welcome to my garden. My name is Jolene and today's video is a bit different than my normal content. You're in for a treat. This is Liam, my son. <laughs> the video you're about to see is a very special one. Um, my father, David Stottlemyre, um, gave lectures around the country on gardening with the beginner gardener in mind. I grew up traveling around the country, mostly on the West Coast, um, listen, listening to my dad give this uh, seminar series. And my sister and I heard them so many times that we always said we could recite them by heart because we just, we knew where all his jokes were. We knew where, you know, the different things he said. And um, so it holds a really special place in my heart. Finally, after many years of him giving these lectures, um, he put these lectures into a five-part DVD series, and that's what you're watching today, one part of the series. Sadly, my dad passed to his rest in 2013 um, after a four-year battle with thyroid cancer. To honor his legacy, our family has decided to release this five-part DVD series onto YouTube for anyone to access and glean from his knowledge. If you would like to own this five-part DVD series, um, then email me in the description down below. I have my email address down there and we'd be happy to mail you one for the price of $24.99, which includes the shipping and the cost of the DVD. We hope you're blessed by this seminar. Now, I'd like to start with a word of prayer before we get going. So let's bow our heads, if you would. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, there's so much to learn from you, and we thank you for this opportunity we've had, and I thank you that I've had this chance to share. And I ask, Lord, that you would bless us and keep us this afternoon and give us wisdom, dear Lord, that comes from above. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to talk a little about pest control. Have you ever felt like this? That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, <laughs> and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. <laughs> oh my, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. And that which hath left. Yeah, it's hard to say that. But, boy, there's not much left after they get done. But, you know, the Lord gives you a promise that goes along with that. And oftentimes, this quote is used in terms of being faithful and paying tithes and offerings. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. Saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. But it doesn't end there. Because it goes on to say, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So there is a blessing that comes with being faithful, and it's more than just the blessings that the Lord pours out to you personally. It can go to your garden and to your fields and so forth. That happened to my mother. Okay, that happened to your mother. So did you all hear that because it was your mother? My mother. Her mother, because she paid tithes and offerings, she believed she received a blessing in that they told her she needed to apply pesticides to her fruit trees. She didn't do it, and yet she received a, a bountiful harvest off of that tree. And I believe that happens even today, like you were saying. <clears throat> Here's another one I like, and this is in the book of Joel, just like the first verse we read about how the canker worm and they all polish off your crops. The Lord can not only bless you, but he can restore. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. The Lord can turn things around in your life. That can be spiritually, and it can be in the garden. I believe all of those things are true. So we're going to talk about pest prevention and control. Now we're going to talk first about Weeds, which are a type of pest, and then we'll go on to animal pests, and I'm going to talk first and mostly about insects, 
but we will talk about some other animals besides because we have deer and other things that are a problem, <coughs> can be considered a pest. And we'll talk about the problem with pesticides, what problems you face by using them, starting to solve the pest problem, and the options available to the organic gardener. So that's kind of where we're headed with this talk. So we'll talk about plant pests first. Prevention. thing to remember with weeds and things like that is that most weed seeds need light to germinate and then you can use that to your advantage by using something like a mulch to keep the seeds from getting light. It will cut way down on your weed problem. You can also use your plant spacing. We talked in our very first talk about using the intensive method to plant and how that fills the area in. That helps to shade the ground and prevent weeds. Then you could do some control methods. And again, just as you can take advantage of the fact that weed seeds need light, you can also take advantage of the fact that weed seeds do not like to be transplanted. Now you might not think so, but a lot of weeds have a long taproot and if you disturb that root, you could damage the plant, set it way back. Um, and a good way to do that is with proper hoeing. And I put down hoeing here. You go through and loosen up your soil with a hoe. It's like transplanting that weed and it will knock it back and oftentimes kill it outright. Now mulches, I want to talk for a moment about mulches, using mulches in the garden. There are a lot of different things you can use. A mulch is a material placed on the soil to conserve moisture and prevent weeds. Here's some examples. Straw, grass, uh, you don't, if you use fresh grass, you don't want to put it too thick because it will mat. Compost, now compost, like I said earlier, is so hard to get and make that you don't just use it willy-nilly as a mulch, but under some circumstances, if you have it, it's a good mulch. Wood chips. Don't mix it into the soil because wood chips are high in carbon and they will pull nitrogen out of the soil as they break down, but use it on the surface, that works great. Leaves, newspaper. I had a student in my class that I was giving this talk and she showed up the next day, it was a girl, and she had this big huge bag of shredded newspaper and she put that out in her garden. And then that night we had what's called the Santa Ana winds come up. <laughs> Uh, I had to adjust my talk to say, if you use newspaper, be sure to weigh it down with something, you know, <laughs> because we had newspaper all over, <clears throat> everywhere. I was out picking these strips of, okay, and woven plastic, um, they make materials now that you can put out in your garden that are woven so the water can go through them. You need to cover that with something because the plastic will break down in the sunlight, it won't last very long. But you can use that and the water can penetrate through it. Some people use carpet, believe it or not. You drag some old carpet out and use that, um, usually not where the plants are growing, but if you're in a straight row, you can put carpet on either side. Um, aluminum foil has been used for certain types of plants. All these things are considered a mulch and you, you can try them if you wish. Here's a, a bed that I made where I used this woven plastic and I hadn't covered it yet, but you could see what it looks like. And I had tomato plants, a little hole for each tomato plant. And then you put, I put wood chips on top of that to, to keep it. And uh, so then any tomato that happened to rest on the ground was not resting on the ground, but on chips. And so you didn't get the uh, problem with tomato on wet soil, you know, where it rots and things like that. And it keeps, keeps the weeds out completely. Plant pests, planting methods to prevent plant pests. Well, this is, this is to prevent weeds. The plants are so close together that there's just not a lot of light getting into the soil. This is the intensive method that we talked about before. And initially, when you first plant something like that, you do have to do some hand weeding, so just keep that in mind. I mentioned that over and over again. Don't think that this is a complete solution but as the plants grow up and fill in, you will have fewer weeds. And then here's the hoe. And as I demonstrated out there, and I made a little drawing here so you could see how this works, the hoe needs to just cut into the soil, and then you pull it right back out the same slot it went in, and it leaves the soil loose like that. Did you like that little? Uh... 
<laughs> Come on, I'll back it up here. There we go. We'll see it again. Okay, now if you could imagine there, if there was a, a weed growing here with its roots going down, you've just sliced through its roots and you fluff the soil. It's like transplanting that little weed. Do you see what I'm saying? And that will damage and set the weed back if it doesn't kill it outright. And it makes the soil nice and loose so you can just pull the weed out if you have to do it by hand. Okay, natural herbicides. And there are some herbicides you can use if you um, want to try to cut down on your weed problem using uh, some natural methods. Here's a corn weed blocker. It's a pre-emergence weed suppressant and fertilizer. And what, you, what it means by pre-emergence is you want to make sure that whatever crop you're growing has already, the seed has germinated and come through the soil. And then you put this on and it prevents weed seeds from germinating. Now this, this product is actually, I've been told you can do the same thing with using cornmeal. I've never tried that. I was, has anyone here ever tried using cornmeal to suppress weeds? There's something in the, in the corn um, that prevents the seeds from germinating. And of course they have a product that you can buy that'll do that, but I've been told you can go and buy cornmeal and do the same thing. I haven't tried it yet, but it might be interesting to try some of that. But again, you want to make sure your crop is up and growing already because it will stop the germination of any seeds that are in there, including the plants you're trying to grow if you put it on too soon. So wait till your crop is up and growing and then put this in. And what happens is it breaks down. It also has nitrogen in it, so it's a little bit of a fertilizer. And by the end of the season, it's gone. So then the following year, it's not going to suppress your crops the next year. It just works for a period of time in the spring into the summer and keeps your weeds down. <clears throat> Here's a spray that you can use that's natural. It's based on clove oil and it'll kill some of your weeds. And another one, this is non-selective, so any weeds that you spray it on, it should work. You don't want to spray it on your crop because it'll suppress them as well. And this is, has citric acid and garlic in it. And it's a strong formulation of that and it evidently burns the leaves and kills the weeds. Pest control. Now we're going to talk about chemical pesticides and we're going to start by talking first about insects. Starting to solve the pest problem. What options are available to the organic gardener? So that's where we're headed. And we're going to talk first about the role of diversity. Now, as with some of the other lectures, I'm going to do a little bit of the, you know, science and then hopefully make it practical. Have I been, I hope I've been doing that okay so far. So that you'll see, this is the principle and then hopefully this is how I apply it in the garden, you know. It's good to understand what's happening and why and then how to make that work for you. Scientists have long determined that in a community, if it's more complex or diverse, it'll be more stable. So that's the building block, the first building block. Second thing is, Diversity, which is what you want in a stable community, it's related to the number of predators. More predators you have, the more diversity. Predators, oddly enough, you would think are bad, but in the garden, they're good. And the reason why is they help control other bugs. Let's put it that way. Now, they did a study where in a um, tide pool, they went and looked at this tide pool, and there were 15 different types of uh, creatures that lived in this tide pool and the scientists went and they marked, blocked it off so nothing could go in and nothing could get out and they determined what the top predator was, number one at the top in this tide pool. So they took that out. So all you had now instead of 15 different species, you had 14 in there and then they just left the tide pool alone and within just a few days the number of creatures that lived in that tide pool had gone from 14 different species down to nine. Because that top predator was controlling a bunch of other things and when it was gone, these other things exploded in population and made other ones go extinct and disappear. So you want to balance in your garden and we're going to see how we can get that. A species relieved of its natural enemies will often monopolize its habitat and thereby become a pest. So if you have some sort of a species and the creature that's controlling it disappears, 
it'll suddenly just bloom in population and become a real problem, become a pest. So this is kind of some of the rules that we're going to try to work with here in just a moment. Pesticides and diversity. So we're going to talk about how pesticides affect this. Most chemical pesticides harm beneficial insects. Most of your beneficial insects are your predators. Only about 3% of the pesticide resistant species are beneficial insects, which means that most of the resistant variety uh, bugs are bad. The ones that seem to develop resistance to pesticides the quickest are the bad ones, what we call bad. Okay? And a loss of beneficial insects reduces diversity and brings instability to the garden. So basically what I'm saying here is we want as much as possible to encourage diversity in the garden, a wide number of plants, a wide number of insects, because the more diverse it is, the more stable it's going to be. And I'm going to demonstrate this and show it with a very interesting thing that happened in Peru. The Canetti Valley of Peru. Now, you all know where Peru is. I have a little map here of South America, and this is the country of Peru. And in Peru, you have the Andes Mountains, large, you know, very tall mountains. And in between these mountains and the coast, you have a very barren desert. There are some areas there where they've never recorded any rainfall since humans have been there and recorded things like that. And these, uh, this plain area between the mountains and the coast are broken by these valleys where the rivers come down out of the Andes and flow through the desert. And it's very fertile, a very good area for having gardens. They have a lot of water. But in between these valleys, you'll have an area 50, 60 miles sometimes with nothing. Barren desert, nothing growing there. So each valley is almost like a little island. So you with me so far on that? Something very interesting happened in the Kennedy Valley. And this is the Kennedy Valley. It starts here and they have a river that runs up. And there's a big gap between this valley and the next one that direction and down this direction. So it's kind of like a little island, so to speak. And this is what the valley looks like. I don't know if you can see it very well. This is the, this is the valley. Can you see these little dark spots here? Those are trees. That, in the story I'm about to tell, that has a role in what we're going to hear. And on the sides of the valley is where the people live. They save the valley floor for their gardening. It's where all the water is, and it's the richest area. So they do all their gardening in the, in the valley floor, and then their houses are along the sides of the valley where they can't, that they can't utilize as well. You can see it's not real, you know, they have poor living conditions there. What happened in the Kennedy Valley, stage one, was around 1920. And they changed, they had a variety of crops, which would mean they have pretty good diversity, and they switched to just one crop. Cotton was doing well, and they were getting good money from cotton. So everybody started switching to growing cotton, just cotton. And that was the main thing they were growing. Stage two happened from about 1943 to 1949. And during that period, Insect control was based on arsenic and nicotine type pesticides. Now those are pretty potent. They are a natural pesticide. And the bugs really had not developed any resistance to these things. But very slowly they started having some problems. Pests increased gradually. The average yields were 415 to 526 pounds of cotton per acre. In 1949, they had a pest outbreak, and the yield is reduced to 326 pounds per acre. That was a big loss for them, and people were concerned. This is our livelihood. We need to do something about this. Well, 1949, you have modern pesticides showing up on the market. So they decide, let's take advantage of these new pesticides and see what we can do. So 1949 to 1956, they changed their cultural practices and to control pests and increase yields. And this is how they did it. They brought in new, powerful, chlorinated hydrocarbons, things like DDT. You've heard of DDT and things like that. They introduced new cotton, more efficient irrigation. 
And they had initial success. Right away, they saw a big benefit. Just like the first time you use a, a chemical fertilizer, first time they did this, made this switch, they had good results. The yield increased in 1950 to 440 pounds per acre, and by 1954, they were up to 648 pounds per acre. They were doing well. These farmers were seeing the results of what they had done, and you know, they were making some money, and that was very good. They were happy. They saw the relationship between pesticide use and yield. The valley was blanketed with insecticides. They cut down all the trees so that they could put the pesticides on better. You know, trees get in the way of airplanes, and so they had airplanes flying down in applying pesticides, and these trees were getting in the way, so they cut all the trees down. What's happening to your diversity here, mm -hmm. right? They have one, you know, just cotton is the only thing they're growing. They've cut down all the trees, and they're putting on these powerful pesticides. Stage three continued, 1949 to 1956. Problems started showing up, and surprisingly enough, they started showing up real quick. 1952, they started this in 49. In 1952, BHC, which is a, a chemical pesticide, it no longer controlled aphids, so they had to switch to something else. The aphids just started eating the stuff. 1954, two years later, toxaphene failed on leafworm, so they had to switch to something else. 1955 to 1956, new pests showed up, resistant to DDT and they switched to organophosphates. You, how many of you know what organophosphates are? Some of them are, they're pretty potent. Some of them are about as toxic as, as you want to ever not even get close to. All right, you, you need to be very careful when you're using them. They were using some of the strongest pesticides known to man at that time. The interval, look at this, the interval between spraying was reduced from 15 days to three days. Every three days, they were blanketing the whole valley with some of the strongest pesticides known to man by air. Innocuous insects rise to pest status. Do you know what an innocuous insect is? Insects that normally don't have bodies. Yeah, it's an insect that you don't even normally notice. And all of a sudden, these things that they had never noticed as being a problem burst into massive populations and were causing all kinds of problems. In 1956, disaster. Millions of bales of cotton were lost and the yield dropped to 296 pounds per acre. This was a big disaster for these. These farmers were not wealthy, all right? You saw what they, they live in. That picture is a recent picture and they don't live in a wealthy situation. And here they lost they, their livelihood was at stake. And they called, somebody figured out, let's call somebody, and they called up to California, to the University of California, Riverside, where I used to work. And California, Riverside University got together a team of men who went down there and looked at what was happening. And surprisingly enough, they said, this is a disaster, and we don't have chemicals that could fix it. What can we do? And they had some entomologists there, they had some ideas, and they decided, let's try to see if we can make some changes and, and maybe we could get something to work here to control this situation because the chemicals were not working. So recovery started when they did that. 1956, they made some changes in their pest control practices. They prohibited certain varieties of cotton. By the way, these researchers were kind of working without any playbook. They, they were just guessing sort of at what would, might work and what wouldn't work. You know, they tried just different things and luckily they got a lot of it right. Natural enemies were brought in, okay? All the beneficial insects were gone, so they brought them back. Methods of planting, plowing, they even had a cotton-free fallow period established. And all the farmers that lived in that little valley agreed to follow whatever these men and women said to do it. So they all agreed and they all got together and did it. Insecticides were only allowed by permission. 
So everybody had to know if, if somebody needed to spray, all the neighbors knew about it. They would get together. They actually would vote and things like that. 1957, the yield was 468 pounds per acre. And then 1958, just two years later, look at the yield. 644 to 922, the yield had gone up higher than it ever was with any of the chemical pesticides. Now what's interesting about this is that this happened in, you notice, 1956, 1958. That generation of farmers grew old. And guess what happened in the 1990s? They had all retired, or some had passed away, some had moved, and their children are now gardening, farming, and it started over again. They started creeping back into using pesticides and herbicides and different things, and all of a sudden all these pests started showing up, but there were enough of the old timers left, and the youngsters listened to them. The old timers said, we've been through this. And all that they got everyone together and they kind of talked about what had happened before and what was happening now and the youngsters listened and they switched back and made changes and prevented it from happening. Which I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. We should all listen to our elders. You think a generation goes by, you read it in the Bible, it seems like every generation, you know, they learn the lesson and they're faithful and then when that generation passes from the scene, they go through it again. Read Judges sometime. And you'll see that just over and over again. Now what happened in this little valley happened very quickly because it was very isolated, all right? Small area, and what happened there happened quick. But what was happening in that valley was actually happening here in the United States on a slower scale. But you know, we were facing the same things. And those researchers, as they saw what happened, went back and reported it. Rachel Carson wrote a book about Silent Spring. And there were others that were saying, we're, we have some problems. And you know, enough people realized it and started making changes that I believe what could have been a disaster here in this country was at least delayed, if not prevented, because people realized what was happening by just indiscriminately using pesticides. And we should be thankful because think of, if that had happened here in this country or in any country on a large scale with our food, if suddenly we had no food, that would be a disaster. So how do we start to solve the problem? In our garden, you know, we've talked about what happened down in Peru. One thing to remember is pest control is adequate if populations are held at tolerable levels. And that word tolerable is important. Some people cannot tolerate even a single little bite out of a leaf, all right? But you need to be aware of what's happening in the garden. Well, can I stand a little chewing here or an aphid or two there? You're going to have pests in your garden. Even if you want to use the strongest chemicals there are, you're still probably going to have a few bugs or this or that. What can you tolerate? And if you could tolerate this amount, then don't take any action. And if it creeps too high, then you start taking steps to control it. Elimination of pests is unrealistic. I used to tell my students that it's like if you have cockroaches in your house, you can use an atomic bomb. It will get rid of the cockroaches, but it'll do a little collateral damage beside. But you, did, you need to know what can I tolerate and what steps am I going to take. You know, don't go for the big atomic bomb to solve a little problem. Is the damage bad enough to require control measures? These are things you need to ask yourself. And if action is needed, use the least disruptive method available. So we're kind of working to the point now, how can we put these things into place? So I want to pause here for a moment and just point out what I think is very curious uh, connection here. We talked about chemical fertilizers. And did you notice when you apply a chemical fertilizer, you have good results when you start? And then you end up applying more? to get the same results, and then eventually you start having a problem with your crop and you have crop loss and you end up, what are you gonna do, change, recover? That's the same thing we had with the chemical pesticides that I just told you about in Peru. Notice, you start with good results, you know, their yield went up, 
So they put on more to get the same results. Then you start having problems and you have a big crop loss or something. And what do you do? Do you notice pattern? <laughs> uh, you see the same pattern in medicine. I know my, my daughter Jolene had a, she has an ear uh, situation, a condition in her ear, and it resulted in a lot of ear infections. And when she first got it, they'd give her amoxicillin and phew, that would just knock it down. But then the amoxicillin didn't work, so they had to get something stronger, remember? <laughs> and then that didn't work. So that before long, she was taking this really strong stuff, and what they finally do? They put tubes in her ear or something? But, you know, I mean, we see this all the time, and sometimes we just pass it by. But do you notice, you get the same pattern here. We need to be aware of that and not get trapped into it, because it's that first step. You get those good results. It, like, lures us in. Isn't that the way sin works? First time you dabble in it, you know, and there's nothing really bad happens, and, you know, it's kind of good. And, but then that doesn't work anymore, so you go a little deeper, you know. You've got to have that same thrill, so you end up deeper, and the next thing you know, you're way deep into it, and Satan tries to get you. So what are your options if you're going to do it organically? Well, there's prevention. The first step for preventing a problem is to have healthy plants, and to have healthy plants, you want to have healthy soil. Then you can protect your plants with other plants. And there are resistant varieties. Then you can take advantage of the pest life cycle. That's another option. And there are control methods you could take, such as biological control, traps and barriers. But usually what I do is, I, in my own garden, I try to start with the, the top ones and work my way down. Save those powerful ones for the last. So prevention, how do we prevent a problem? Again, healthy plants are less susceptible to pests. And to have healthy plants, you really need a good, healthy soil. And that's why you want to make sure the soil is fertile. You work it up like we did double dig or whatever you do to get your soil nice and in good shape. Give them the water they need. Problem is usually an unhealthy soil. Then you could protect your plants with other plants, and this would be your companion planting. And there are, there are good combinations and bad combinations, and there are a lot of books that have been written about companion planting. Uh, again, this book on how to grow more vegetables, it does talk a little bit about companion planting. You uh, can plant, you know, like corn and beans together and things like that. There are also combinations that are not good. Uh, you don't want to follow onions with beans because the onions leave something in the soil. I had real poor germination. I, I had uh, onions, and then the next year I went to plant my beans, and hardly any of them came up, and the ones that did looked really sad, and I'm going, what happened here? This was years ago, and so I opened up my book, and oh yeah, sure enough, onions and uh, beans don't like each other. Okay, that made sense. So you could protect your plants with uh, other plants. Marigolds are good. They, act, they get rid of nematodes in the soil. And we will talk more about flowers in just a moment. Some plants complement each other. And uh, like I said, you can look through the books and see some of these complementary plants and plant them with each other, and they will help each other. Some will repel pests and so forth. And just by having a variety of plants in your garden, you get more diversity, and that will reduce your pest problem. There are resistant varieties. This is most often for diseases. You've probably any of you have ever bought seeds, the catalogs will tell you it's resistant to this and resistant to that. They do have some that are resistant to insects, but that's very rare to find those. The effectiveness of a lot of your resistance is short-lived, especially for insects, usually about five years or so, and then the insects will figure out some way of getting around the resistance. It's just the way nature works. It's most effective against your diseases. Then you can take advantage of the bug's natural life cycle. This will work, but you have to take some notes. Uh, I found uh, down in California when I was growing corn that my really early corn that I planted always got the earworms, 100% earworms. And then the stuff I planted a little later in the season, at a certain point, there were no earworms. And then at the very tail end of the season, they would come back about 30 or 40% of them would have earworms. So I 
always kept notes and I figured out that there was a window here that if I planted my corn during this period of time, I had no earworms. So if that was important to you, now for our family, we would just cut them off and, you know, we didn't worry about that so much. But if it was important to you to raise corn without earworms, you can do it if you keep track of something like that. That's why having a little notebook and, and keeping track of things is important. So you can take advantage of the bug's uh, natural life cycle by adjusting your planting time. Plant around the pest problem. Crop rotation is important. And a simple rotation is to alternate leaf crops with root crops. One year you have a leaf crop, next year you have a root crop. Just make sure they aren't antagonistic to each other. Because most of the pests that like your leaf crops do not like root crops and vice versa. So the root crop pests will hatch out the next year and they'll wake up and look for root crops and, oh no, there's just leaf crops here. And they get all upset and leave. And that's the idea. Then there are biological controls. Now, biological controls can be very, very effective. Um, and you can control a lot of pests using biological controls. Includes predators, parasites, and even microbial control. There are microbes that you can use. For example, uh, somebody was talking about uh, the cabbage, cabbage worm. You know, you could get, they have a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt. You could mix that in with water and put that on your uh, cabbage plants. And the uh, caterpillars, when they eat that, it kills them. But the Bt doesn't do anything to the human digestive system. In fact, you could eat the stuff, it tastes terrible, but if you ate it, your stomach just digests it. It doesn't do anything to you, but it kills the caterpillar. So it has no effect on, on anything but the caterpillar. So it's a targeted, and that's, it works very well. Now we're gonna talk about flowers. And I think this is the most underrated thing as far as controlling pests, as, as far as insects go is flowers. They are so important in and near the garden. Besides the fact that they just are beautiful to have around, flowers are necessary for a lot of your beneficial insects. Now most beneficial insects in the larva stage, or a lot of them in the larva stage, they will feed on your bad bugs. But when they are adults, they need pollen and nectar. And the best place to get pollen and nectar is flowers. So if you can have flowers in your garden, it will attract the beneficial insects and it will keep them in the garden and they will help control your pest problem. Now years ago when they were first working with beneficial insects, they did a study in Canada where they, it was in a fruit orchard, I think it was apples, and they had determined that this particular pest problem could be solved with a, a beneficial, it was a predatory wasp. The wasps are real small. In fact, the stingers can't even, they don't have stingers that could bother you. And they, so they brought these wasps up, they released them, and nothing happened. So they brought another batch of them up and released them, and nothing happened. So they called an entomologist, somebody who deals with insects, and they said, what's going on? We've released these beneficial insects, and they aren't doing anything. And he walked out in the orchard, looked around, and he said, where's your flowers? Well, they didn't have any. They kept the place real clean. It was a, you know, a research station. So they, they mowed everything down and had it all looking nice for when the president walked through. And he said, you know, you need to have some flowers here. You bring these poor little insects up, you release them, and you expect them to go out and, and they're predatory, so uh, they're not gonna go looking for bugs to uh, parasitize. First, they want something to eat, all right? They wanna go to a restaurant and, you know, fill up and get something to eat, and then they're gonna go out and lay their eggs and parasitize. So what they did was they grew, allowed some flowers to grow and right away the control that they were looking for happened. So the flowers in and around your garden have an important role. Now what type of flowers? Not all flowers are created equal. Uh, the composite family, which are your sunflower and daisy type, are, are very uh, beneficial to have in and around your garden. And the other group, that is very important, are your umbiliferae. I'm not sure if I said that right. Let's just pretend I did. But they form like an umbrella. This would be uh, your carrot, dill, parsley, fennel, uh, yarrow, things like that. You know, that looks like an umbrella. You've, all, you've probably all seen those. The flowers are very small, but the beneficial insects love them. 
So what do they look like? Here's your daisy type. Now, this is not actually the flower. The flower is in here. This is, these are just bracts. The flower part is in the middle, and that's where the pollen and the nectar is. And the beneficial insects will go in there, and they just love to get the pollen and nectar. And this would be your umbel shape. Notice it looks like an umbrella, your dill. If you could grow a wild you know, carrot, whatever. Uh, again, the beneficial insects are attracted to these type of flowers. You know, it's, it's nice to have tulips and daffodils and stuff, but th this type of flower is actually much better in bringing and keeping your beneficial insects in and around your garden. And this was my garden in California, and I had right in the middle of the garden, I had some little, these are called Dahlberg daisies. Uh, they reseed every year. And a little flower, and boy, you'd go there and you'd just see all the little beneficial insects from ladybugs and green lacewings and uh, the predatory wasps and all kinds of things around these. Here's some dill growing here, and this is my uh, umbel shape. Uh, this is, I think, the yarrow growing there. This is another, this was near the garden, this is in the garden, this one is near the garden, and I just planted wildflower seed and allowed it to come up and grow. And again, a lot of beneficial insect activity, and of course that spreads out and helps control the insect problem in the garden. And I had very few insect problems after a few years, all right? Initially, I had all kinds of problems, but every year went by and I kept nurturing my flower gardens and kept working with it, and before long, I had hardly any problem with any insects. Let's talk a few a moment or two about some biological controls. Let's we'll talk about ladybugs. Do we like ladybugs? <laughs> yeah, we do. There's your picture of the adult. And here's the larva. Now, the larva is much more effective in controlling aphids and other pests than are the adults. The adults will eat maybe two or three aphids in a day, where the larva will eat 10 or 15 or even more. And they don't have wings, so they can't fly. That's the nice thing. Now, when I was little, I thought these were baby guillemot monster lizards. <laughs> I don't know why. And then one day I was out playing in the yard, and one of these things had attached itself to a leaf. And the next day when I came, it had formed a little yellow orangish ball. And so I started watching, and I was curious. And a ladybug hatched out of that, and I thought I had made a great discovery in science, but I was disappointed to know that science already knew about that, and I hadn't really discovered anything at all. But, so these are the adults, and they do feed on your aphids, but the uh, larvae are very effective in controlling aphids. Now here's a very special ladybug, the Vidalia beetle. And I have a story that goes with this. Do you like stories? <laughs> 1887, California has citrus. And something shows up, a white pest, and nothing is controlling it. 1887, they thought that California would never have any citrus at all, period. The trees were covered with this white pest. The trees looked like they had snow on them. That's how bad they were. It was killing the trees. The farmers would put tents over the trees and would put nicotine in there. It's, it is a uh, bug? It is a uh, cotton cushiony scale. And they would, they would put uh, nicotine and they would put stuff in there to try to kill these. And the minute they'd take the tent off, the stuff would come back. And they were wondering, where did this come from? What is this stuff, and how do we control it? And they didn't have anything to control it. And they thought citrus was dead in California. They wouldn't be able to grow citrus there at all. And an entomologist had gone through some of his books, and he said, you know, I think that these cotton cushiony scale come from Australia, but they're not a problem in Australia. Something must be controlling them over there. Let's find out what it is. So they sent him, they put him on a boat, because back then that's all they had. They put him on a boat to Australia, and he went to Australia, and he looked and looked. He couldn't find these in Australia until he went, I think it was in, the, in uh, uh, Melbourne, Australia. He went into a, a botanical garden, 
and he found just a couple of these scale insects and these ladybugs were eating them. So he got a couple of these ladybugs and brought them back to the United States, to California, and they built a tent and they released, oh, I think it was maybe 50 of them. They had, didn't have very many of them because they, you just didn't see them even in Australia very much. So they released them and they went to town on these cotton cushiony scale. They started eating them and they laid eggs and the larvae were eating them and the farmers were coming and begging, give us some of these ladybugs. So they, you know, they, the farmers were about ready to lift the edges of the tent up and just let them go. So they finally, all right, all right, we'll let them go. And they, they lifted up the tent and one year later, citrus had been saved. They had completely decimated this cotton cushiony scale in one year. So what happens a generation later? They sprayed something, the DDT came out, and they, they were using it to control something completely unrelated up in the Central Valley. California has, you know, Southern California, and then there's a Central Valley, they call it. And in the Central Valley, they had citrus, but they had other stuff too, and they were spraying DDT, and suddenly their citrus trees were covered with this cotton cushiony scale again. And again, it looked like snow. And they said, oh no, this pesticide is especially good at killing these Vidalia beetles. Now they had not sprayed any DDT in Southern California. So you know what the farmers were doing? This is really interesting. The farmers from Central California stopped spraying the DDT. They were coming down to Southern California and they were paying a dollar per beetle and taking them back up to Central California. Now this is when price of gas was what, 19 cents a gallon? All right, they were paying a dollar a beetle to bring these beetles back up to Central Valley and reintroduce them. And the amazing thing is, that was 19, uh, I think it was 54, 56 that that happened. It happened again in 1990. They were spraying for something else and they killed off the Vidalia beetles, but this time they caught it early and were able to, to fix the problem. <laughs> Three times it's happened. And that's our little Vidalia beetle. It shows you how important natural control is. And if you interrupt that balance, it could be a big problem. Green lacewings. Here's the larva. You've probably seen the adults flying around at night and stuff. The larva are very active in controlling aphids. The nickname for this is the aphid lion. So that's the larva, the aphid lion. There is a... Uh, a related lacewing that lays eggs and the larva goes down in the soil and makes a little cone and it's called an antlion. Some of you may have seen or heard of those. So the uh, larvae are very effective in controlling pests. And again, the adult lacewing only feeds on pollen and nectar. Cirripid flies. These are hover flies. You see these hovering around uh, your flowers. They'll, they'll back up. They look like little... Uh, I don't know, those little those jets that can hover, you know, they go back and forth and stuff. Okay? Look at the larva. Looks like a little caterpillar, doesn't it? But it has a distinctive, can you see the little white stripe down its back? It's not a very good picture here, but there's a white stripe down its back. That's what you look for. If you see these in the garden, they are beneficial, not bad. See, I had a, I gave this talk once and a guy came up to me afterwards and said, well, I've seen those caterpillars in my garden, I've been killing them. And I said to him, have you seen any damage to your plants? I mean, the caterpillars, were they eating your plant? And he thought, and he goes, no, I hadn't seen any chewing on it. But see, he didn't wait to see whether the, the caterpillar, what he thought was a caterpillar, was doing any damage. He just saw it and started spraying for it. Instead of asking, oh, do I see any damage here around on the leaf? And if there's no damage, then why? Why take any effort? This guy doesn't eat anything but bad bugs. But it looks like a caterpillar. So you gotta be, educate yourself on some of these things in the garden. It can really save you a lot. Traps and barriers, you could use those to prevent uh, pests from reaching your crops. You can kill and trap your pests, like tanglefoot, ants. Uh, you could put tanglefoot around the base of your tree. Sometimes an aphid problem, is an ant problem. 
because the ants will actually protect the aphids and will move them around from place to place because they get the, the milk. It's a sweet material out of the aphid. And uh, so they watch over them. I had that problem on one of my fruit trees last year and I took care of it. Uh, you can make a yeast water mix for snails. People used to take beer and they'd put it out in the garden and the snails would go in. And, uh, but it's not actually beer that does it, it's the yeast. They like the yeast. So if you mix yeast with water, you can put that out. It's like a little trap. Barriers. Snails aren't much of a problem up here, are they? I see some people shaking their head. See, down where I live, they are. They, they brought the snails in for eating. They're escargot snails, and then they got loose. And now we have all these escargot, the brown snails in California, and they just eat everywhere. Slugs are bad. Real. Slugs are bad. Okay. Barriers for preventing uh, the pests from reaching the plant. Uh, paper cup around the base of your plant to prevent cutworm. You can have snail bar, that's a copper strip. You put it around like if you have a tree and the snail or the slug tries to climb up and the slime interacts with the copper and it shocks them so they won't cross over it. Here's a couple of pictures, apple maggot trap and a coddling moth trap. These are just a couple of traps. Here's a peach tree boar lure. A lot of these are available if any of you are interested um, this catalog that I have, uh, Peaceful Valley, has a lot of these type of things in it. This is, they kind of specialize in organic control of pests. And they have in here a whole big section where it lists the pests and then it has, you know, control methods and it has little dots here so you can read through and see what it is, what is my pest and what are the different options for controlling that particular pest. Barriers, here's your snail bar. Like I said, it's just copper. And they have stick them. Again, it traps the little ants try to crawl in there and they get stuck. Tangle foot, same thing. Let's see, here's a barrier. This is a friend of ours that had problems with deer. It wasn't a large garden, so he just built a uh, covering. He has a... Uh, wire that he just lifts up and gets in and does his work inside these raised beds and uh, is able to protect them from the deer. And he also has strawberries where he did the same thing. I put a fence around my whole garden, but most people up here I think fence. A lot of people do. Here's my gopher bed I told you about. I was having... and The story with this is, is I would get artichoke plants from the university uh, they gave them away free. And so I'd bring them home and I'd plant them in my garden. And you know those gophers that we had down there? Artichoke must be number one on their diet list because they would wait until my little artichoke plant got nice. I mean, and I was seeing the artichokes coming and uh, my mouth was starting to water and I would go out and the thing would be dead overnight. And I would reach down like this and you just pick it up and it was cut off right at the ground level. Everything below the ground had been eaten. They could smell those artichoke roots, I guess, and they would like a beeline. Those gophers would go right for my artichoke plants. And three years in a row, I lost, I didn't get a single artichoke. So the fourth year, I built this little thing. I spent a little extra money. This is that plasticized wood. Uh, six inch, six and a half inches high, and I got two of them, so it, it went up about, you know, 12 inches high or so. And I put welded wire or hardware cloth across the bottom, and I filled it up with soil and put my artichokes in there, and we had artichokes. <laughs> Good artichokes. Remember that? Yeah. We had lots of them. So you could take, sometimes you could do something like that. If you, a targeted pest problem, you could target a control just for that pest. Now I saved repellents and poisons for the last, because too often that's the first thing we grab. You see a problem, you grab the, you know, what can I do to prevent this? What can I do? And you grab the, the spray or whatever it is. And I'm saying there's other things we can oftentimes do that are less cause less uh, hazard and less problem. And you're not spraying some of these strong things in your garden. You don't need to necessarily. Repellents will keep your pests away by sight, sound, or smell, or taste. Like crop guard, 
This is a brand name. It uses garlic. Uh, hot pepper wax, wax. The idea here is uh, the, the pest will take a bite of it, especially larger creatures like a uh, raccoon or deer or something like that. They take a bite and they get the, or birds. And it supposedly will be so hot and they'll, so they'll leave it alone. It can work sometimes. You've got to do it at the right time and use the right amount. Scarecrows. I brought this. This is one of my favorites. You ever seen one of these? <laughs> it's a kite. But it's a, you can use it as a scarecrow to keep birds away from your garden. If you attach the string here, you could fly it like a kite. And when it flies, it does this. It flaps its wings, all right? If you attach the string here on its beak or on its nose, beak, beak, I guess, uh, you hang it, you run up a PVC pipe in your, in your garden, like, like say in your orchard, all right? You want to keep birds from pecking on your fruit trees, on your fruit? You attach a fishing line up on this pole, and when the wind comes, it then lifts this guy up, and he flaps around and flaps in the wind, all right? And there are a lot of birds that don't particularly like this. And it's fairly realistic. Uh, I was using it once as a kite down at the ocean, and I had this lady come running up to me. And she said, you've caught that hawk in your fishing line. Because I had it on a fishing line. Or, you know. And I said, it's a kite. And she looked at me, and she looked at this thing. It was up there doing this. And she looked at me, and then she looked at it, and then she smiled real big <laughs> and realized it was a kite. Sure enough, I hadn't, she thought I had caught a bird with a you know, fishing hook or something. But, uh, and this, this is made out of a, a special type of paper that, that lasts a long time. I've had this for, uh, oh, what, probably 15 years now. Um, I don't use it outside a lot, but it will last for many, many years. And they have different ones. This one is a uh, osprey. They have an a eagle and they have another bird of prey. I think they have three or four different ones you can get. And like I said, if you hook it through the mouth, it'll, it flaps its wings. And because it moves around, it's not like these stuffed owls that you stick out and they just sit there and the birds land on them and things. Uh, this actually moves and acts like a real bird. And uh, it, can, it can be effective for some things. Again, you know, nothing works 100%. But there are tools in our toolbox that we can use in our garden that help us and can keep the problem down to a manageable level. And this might be one and there might be some others. I want to show this too before I go on. This poster was popular. What's bugging you? Chemical pesticide. Seven will solve it, whatever it is. What this doesn't show you is that uh, seven is really good at controlling ladybugs and, uh, and uh, bees, honeybees. Seven will just decimate honeybees. And that's the problem with using some of these products is that they're more effective on the good bugs than on the bad ones. And you want the good ones in your garden. They will do a great work for you in controlling the bad ones and keeping the population down to where you can tolerate it. Poisons, that's last on my list, to kill or to sicken the pest. And there are some poisons that are available, some organic. Uh, most of the bugs have not developed resistance to organic poisons simply because they break down very quick in the environment. People don't like to use them because they don't last long enough, but that's actually a benefit because if it breaks down quick, the insect doesn't get a chance to build up a resistance to it. And uh, there's a whole lecture there if you ever want to hear that. The earth has been cursed because of sin, and in these last days vermin of every kind will multiply. These pests must be killed, or they will annoy and torment and even kill us and destroy the work of our hands and the fruit of our land. In places there are ants, and in this case they were talking about termites, which entirely destroy the woodwork of homes. Should not these be destroyed? Fruit trees must be sprayed that the insects which would spoil the fruit may be killed. God has given us a part to act, and this part we must act with faithfulness. Then we can leave the rest with the Lord. And I think that's important. We need to have a balance. And I'm not telling you that insecticides and pesticides are always bad. There's a place for things in the environment. Sometimes we have to take steps 
to control pests. But there are levels that we can, you know, don't start with the most powerful thing. Work your way up to it. Try to find alternative ways of controlling problems. And here's the picture that's on my desktop taken in uh, San Luis Obispo. We like that as a family shot. The end. Now, I do have one little video clip here at the end, and I think it has to do with uh, using the hoe, weeding with a hoe. Again, my garden looks a little dry. This is California, okay? But here are my plants, and they're planted intensively, but when they're small like this, you can get in between as long as you stay outside the area where the roots are, which means stay away from the leaves. Notice I'm staying away. Here's the edge of the leaf, and I'm staying away from that. I work my way up, just hoeing. Again, slicing into the soil and bringing the hoe back. Okay? And you can see that it leaves the surface. You want to kill the, root, the, the seeds, the weed seeds in that surface layer and not bring new weeds up. And so you'll see that the, the surface is still there. See how it's crumbly? You can see that some of that dried surface soil is still pretty much there. And this is what it looks like when it's done. It's nice and loose, so if there are any weeds, you can pick them out with your hands. Uh, you've disturbed the roots. And here at the end, this is a picture of that exact same bed a little later. This is the same year. There's a little, not much in the way of weeds, and you can see they've grown together, so now there's no weeds in there because they've shaded it out. So once or twice with the hoe, a little bit of hand weeding, and then uh, that was about it. That's all I ever had to do with a bed like that. And here's my artichoke. See them? There's that bed that I showed you earlier. Just the corner, you can see the plants, nice and healthy. Like I said, we got some good artichokes. There's my flowers that you saw earlier, other beds down here. All right. Any questions about that? I have a comment about it. Okay. The control. I tried those threads, sticky traps, mm -hmm. and I also tried the other, the causing lock traps. Okay. I think I had, I'm sure I had more damage than I had had before. Oh, really? And that's why I wrote to the company and said they sent me a whole uh, page of the stuff that you could spray with the one you should. And I kept trying that. Last year I was just too lazy and something that didn't hang the trash. I had less than it. I think uh, that they uh, it, attracted it. It attracted it. Uh -huh. That could be. Now see, we didn't have coddling moss down in California and I don't, my fruit trees are not big enough yet to worry about that. So I'm anxious to see as, as things mature and over the years how that plays out in my garden and in my orchard, yes. We found a, a light bulb hanging over a container of water with just a skim of oil. It's a real good moss trap. And we found the moss do love to come to the light. And, uh, yeah. A lot of that is that you have and you don't Okay. Yeah, for the tape, we had here a suggestion of a light over a container of water with a thin layer of oil and that tracks the moths and fall in. And then we had to mention that uh, there's a territorial thing going on. Is that what you I were saying? Some areas you'll find certain insects you don't find. Some areas you have, certain, you have pests in certain areas that are not in others. Yeah, that, that's true. You do get that. What about clearing out an area for our garden where there's never been one before and there's a lot of plant growth there already that needs to be cleared out like grass and weeds? Yeah. Yeah, you could use a rototiller in there or have it tilled a couple of times, like, a, like Charlie said. Um, another thing to do, too, you might lay down, if you know it's going to be later, you could lay down some black plastic to uh, shade out and kill. The, the crop, the plants that are growing underneath that. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, what about worms in uh, turnips and blueberries? Well, I've never had worms in any, either of those crops. Really? Okay, any suggestions here? See now, 
we're dealing here with vocal problems, and uh, I may not have all the answers, you understand, but we have worms in rutabaga and turnips. Anybody here have? They're called root maggots. Root maggots by a fly. And they were an extreme problem in Alaska. And the only thing that was always a sure success was to plant each plant through a hole in plastic. And the flies won't lay their eggs if they land on plastic. plastic. But you have to take and water down the hole to keep them irrigated. So it's a little more intense for the watering. A little more, okay, so for the tape, he was saying that there's, it's a, a, ma a, a root maggot, it's a little fly, and so you have to plant the plant with plastic so that the fly won't lay its eggs, but it's a little more difficult. Now, could you put it like a drip line underneath yes. that plastic and water that way? Okay. All right. That would make sense. All right. We